Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm Frat Demir from the OU Center for Future and Development and Department of Economics, as well as the Security and Context Network. This is our second talk hosted by the OU CPD and SIC this semester. Our distinguished guest today is Dr. Mark Weisbrod, who is the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, DC. His most recent book is titled Failed, What the Experts Got Wrong About the Global Economy. It was published by the Oxford University Press in 2015. Dr. Weisbrod has written numerous research papers on economic policy, and his opinion pieces have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, The Guardian, and almost every other major uh, US newspaper. Mark, welcome. And uh, before further ado, the floor or the camera is yours. Thank you, Ferhat, and uh, thank you, Stephanie, too, for helping to uh, organize this uh, event. And, and I want to thank everybody who's come here uh, to uh, because they're interested in this. I think this is a, a very important issue. And it's also a story of change and how change takes place, because this is something that wasn't going to happen, what I'm going to describe. And it was blocked as soon as it was proposed by the, the head of the IMF back in March of 2020. And then it happened because literally over a hundred groups in, in the United States representing tens of millions of people, including you know, the biggest religious denominations uh, and uh, the groups like Oxfam and the AFL-CIO all uh, went to Congress and uh, I think this is very important because this is very often how, you know, Congress for all its faults is, is the most accountable uh, part of our, our government uh, because people can go and, and, you know, talk to them, uh, talk to their staff and, and they vote. <laughs> they have to, in the House, they have to get elected every two years. And so this was a, a real change that took place and saved uh, probably hundreds of thousands of lives and could have saved a lot more if it weren't, it wasn't blocked uh, when, before it got off the ground. So what is the story here that we're talking about? And uh, well, it started back in March of 2020 when the pandemic was accelerating and the head of the IMF, uh, Kristalina Crystal, Gorgieva, uh, said, uh, announced in a speech that the, United, that the uh, IMF should issue uh, a large amount of what they call special drawing rights. Now this is, and I'll explain what that in, is in a minute, but, uh, and she suggested, you know, in her speech, she said that the financing needs of the uh, developing countries were something around uh, two and a half trillion dollars. And so uh, that's the kind of thing I think she was, she was definitely thinking of, a very large issuance. And of course, it's not that large relative to the, you know, the world economy is over 100 trillion, but it was, uh, and, and it doesn't cost anything as we'll see, but that's what she uh, proposed. And it was, and finance needs, it's, it's an IMF accounting term, basically, it, it's what you need, what a government needs to avoid uh, some kind of balance of payments uh, crisis or uh, debt or fiscal uh, crises. And so um, this is what she proposed. And the Trump administration uh, moved immediately to block it because uh, they can do that at the IMF. And that's another problem that we're going to talk about. We keep running into that this is uh, 190 countries. And because of this, uh, you know, inertia from over 70 years ago when the institution was created, the United States is still uh, gets to uh, decide almost everything or veto almost anything, but really decide, uh, you know, have the final authority over anything that the institution does. And that, that's a problem that keeps coming up and I'll get to it. So now what are SDRs? That's a big part of the story. So I have to explain that, and special drawing rights. So this is a reserve currency, uh, I'm sorry, not a currency. <laughs> the media often calls it that, that's not accurate. It's a reserve asset issued uh, by the International Monetary Fund. 
And the reason it has uh, so much value uh, in this, you know, in the pandemic and recession is because it's a reserve asset that central banks can hold. Um, so it's like holding U.S. treasuries in a way. Uh, they all, the way our financial, the international financial system works is that all central banks, uh, all countries have to have these reserve assets that they can use uh, for imports, um, for anything that they need, that they can't pay for in their own currency. And the main currency that's used is uh, U.S. dollars, but there are also other currencies uh, you know, that are used to a lesser extent, you know, the euro, the pound. This is a reserve asset that the IMF can actually create, and it's not money uh, because there is no world currency. And of course, uh, you know, some of the founders of the IMF and the people who talked about it when it was founded, before it was founded, like even Keynes himself, they wanted to have a, a, a bank. They wanted the IMF to be like a, an international bank with an international currency, but we didn't get that. But we did get uh, something that is a little bit similar in the sense that these reserve assets under IMF rules, these special drawing rights can be exchanged for hard currencies. We call hard currencies, which includes the dollar, the euro, it's five currencies, the pound, uh, the renminbi, and the Japanese yen. And so these can be, um, these can be exchanged. And so that that makes a huge difference, as you can imagine, in a uh, world recession, and even when the you know the the world economy is still recovering, uh, you still have the pandemic, and so uh, countries that can show need uh, can uh, actually convert these um, these assets to uh, to a hard currency, and they can use it for imports. They can import vaccines. They can import medicines. They can import medical equipment. And so that has a life-saving impact right there, but also they can, it can protect their economy. So even the ones that don't exchange their, uh, their SDRs for hard currency, just having those currency, having those reserve assets can help prevent uh, crises. First of all, it lowers their borrowing costs because, you know, interest rates go up when you, uh, for a, uh, uh, sovereign bonds, interest rates go up when the country starts to run low on these international uh, reserves. So when you have these, it's just like, again, it's like having dollars or US treasuries or some other uh, asset that, um, that countries have uh, for balance of payments purposes. And so it lowers their interest rates, their borrowing, but most importantly, it helps them avoid any kind of balance of payments crisis where investors start to flee the country and the currency because they think uh, they're going to run out of out of money, out of uh, uh, international payments, and uh, so that's what uh, that's what this does, and so that's why it's so important. And I want to say how important it is because it's the, the human cost. People, most people, don't realize how much of the economic cost of a recession is human cost for most of the world. It is in the U.S. too. You know, it raises the mortality right here when we have a a recession, people die, but um, nowhere near as much as in the uh, developing world. So, for example, in June, the World Food Program estimated that uh, an increase in one year of 121 million people who have become what they call acutely food insecure or at high risk since the pandemic uh, began. And uh, this is an unprecedented 81% increase. And it can kill uh, millions of people, and especially children, because you know children uh, suffer from uh, malnutrition and as a result of these economic uh, losses. And, and they are, malnourishment makes children, so they don't actually die from a, a completely from malnourishment, but the malnourishment makes them more susceptible to diseases that kill them. That's why it is it's children enormously harder than adults. And so more people have actually died from the impact 
of the world recession from the pandemic than have died from the virus uh, itself. And that is why you know, this is so uh, vitally important. To get back to the story, because again, this is a, a story of how change takes place and, and how important this is. The SDRs were proposed by the head of the IMF and then the uh, Trump treasury immediately said no. And that was kind of the end of it uh, at the IMF. So uh, a bunch of organizations, including us, oh, and I should say that, you know, uh, if you want more information, uh, the Center for Economic and Policy Research, which is my organization, uh, we have a lot of it on our website and links to other places. And so you can find more there. But we were uh, part of this and we got a lot of other groups. And uh, so all these groups went to Congress and said, you know, this is really what we need uh, for the world economy. And so the House last year twice, uh, as a result of all these organizations, as I said, representing tens of millions of people, they, they twice passed a bill for 2 trillion SDRs which I'll use the dollar equivalent because it makes more sense to people. So that's a $2.8 trillion worth of SDRs. And it passed the House twice, but it was blocked in the Senate by the Republicans. And then they come, you know, the House came back and passed it again this year. But again, it can't get past the Senate right now. And I want to mention that actually this is partly in Oklahoma or uh, audience, there was one senator, one Republican senator who did uh, take our side for a little while, and he was very powerful. That's Jim Inhofe, and he's the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee, and that makes him very influential, uh, especially in a, a bill like this, because he tried to attach it to the National Defense Authorization Act, which is what people do to get these kind of things uh, passed, things that most you know, most of Congress doesn't care that much about. And uh, he tried to get that and he was uh, defeated, uh, but he did try. Um, and so that's something to think about because this is how this happens. I mean, this is, I can tell you this, you know, uh, all our, all these groups, you know, we all met with senators and their staff and members of the house and their staff. And, you know, it was a long uh, struggle and it's still going on. But uh, that's one of the positive aspects of this system is that you can get a group of constituents and go meet with a uh, staff or sometimes the senator or member of Congress himself. And if there's no powerful lobby on the other side, uh, they will very often just go with their constituents because there's nothing to lose. And there's really nothing to lose here. I mean, first of all, uh, I didn't mention this yet, but this doesn't cost the U.S. government or any government, anything at all. Now, that may seem uh, strange because it ends up for a lot of countries being real money. Uh, but the reason it doesn't cost anything is because the IMF can actually create it. Now, this, of course, a lot of people have problems with this because it doesn't, you know, it's not intuitive. But if you think about, um, and a lot of people have problems with this because it's not <laughs> intuitive either, but if you think about quantitative easing which our Federal Reserve has done, our central bank has done uh, since, uh, I think it was the beginning of 2008, um, you know, trillions of dollars that they've uh, created. And it didn't cause any inflation whatsoever. In fact, for over a decade, uh, the inflation was barely ever past uh, 2%, which was the Fed's uh, target. You have some inflation now, but nobody, I don't see anybody claiming that it's a result of the Fed's uh, quantitative easing, which is still continuing at uh, $120 billion a month. And uh, so this is very important. And this gets to the macroeconomics of the issue, which I, I want to get into a little bit, because it's, again, it's another way of showing how important this is. I mean, let's face it, this is a very unequal uh, world and U.S. Uh, economy, and it's bad enough that you know we have tens of millions of people are hungry in the U.S. and all this money is 
being wasted on space flights, for example, the income share of the top 1% has uh, doubled uh, over the last uh, uh, couple of decades, which is you know really outrageous. And uh, but on the world scale, everything is so much worse because you know one way to see it is look what happens when we have this pandemic and this recession. Uh, uh, leaving aside the vaccine apartheid, which is you know even worse than this in some way, in, in terms of the human cost, I think you know the fact that the United States and the, its rich country allies have uh, blocked uh, you know the developing countries from even from getting the knowledge and the technology to manufacture vaccines. You know, there's no reason for I mean, it's bad enough to say, okay, we're gonna hoard all these things. But then you, when you, you know, there's a amendment at the World Trade Organization uh, from the developing country saying, you know, we want to suspend these uh, intellectual property rights and we want this knowledge to be shared uh, for the duration of the pandemic. And then the United States and its allies uh, block it. That's you know that's even worse. Well, this is kind of a similar thing, uh, you know, at the IMF, right? Uh, the blocking of this by a handful of countries. Because you got, as I said, you got 190 countries. Almost every one of them wanted it. <laughs> wanted the SDRs, okay, the issuance that that the managing director proposed. And then you know. Uh, Mnuchin puts his foot down and the discussion is over. Now, here, here's how it looks, you know, macroeconomically. In the United States, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, lowered interest rates, the short-term rate that uh, the Fed directly controls to uh, the overnight rate to zero, created more than uh, $3.6 trillion uh, through quantitative easing uh, since the pandemic began. And then you also had this unprecedented fiscal policy you, uh, where our government ran a 15% of GDP uh, budget deficit last year, which I think has never happened before without a war. And, uh, and then uh, uh, projected for around 13% for uh, this year. So this is huge. That's how we got the expanded uh, child tax credit, the unemployment benefits, the uh, um, food stamps expanded, the stimulus checks that we've never had before at uh, that level. And, and you actually, we actually lowered the poverty rate in the United States in spite of the uh, recession where it normally increases. So that's what you can do in a country like the United States that's uh, a high income country. And of course you had different measures in Europe. They took a different approach. They didn't have as much uh, fiscal policy, but they were able to uh, do a, more to keep people's attachment to their employment, for example, in, in a number of countries. But in any case, they were able to do way more than the vast majority of the world uh, can do. And uh, so that's why that's the inequity, that's part of the, the economic policy aspect of the inequity that we're trying to correct here uh, and to equalize as much as we can uh, with this, uh, this capacity of the IMF to create uh, this international reserve asset. Now, uh, we'll have a Q&A here so people can, because I know that this isn't always uh, and this is a problem that you have too in Congress. It's 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 something you have to think about a little bit to try and uh, understand and to get some information. So you know, you should feel free to act, ask questions about uh, you know how this works. A little more detail on what has actually happened and what's happening going forward. Um, so when uh, the Biden administration uh, took office, because of this massive. Uh, effort in, in Congress, the Treasury Department uh, issued uh, the, well, I shouldn't say they issued it because they don't actually, they don't officially uh, control the IMF, but they allowed the IMF uh, to issue uh, $650 billion worth of these uh, special drawing rights. And that happened just uh, in the last couple of months. 
and finally came out. So again, this was a long, because this is, you know, this is the great thing about the, the special drawing. I'm gonna tell you, this is why we jumped on this right away, because it's, it's really different from anything else that this organization uh, called the IMF ever does, okay? Uh, and I have to emphasize that because the IMF does a lot of lending and it's, uh, it's, the, uh, it's probably the most powerful financial institution in the world. And partly because it attaches condition to this, conditions to this lending. And these conditions are uh, often uh, net negative. In other words, that it, it, it very often happens that the country is worse off uh, getting the loan uh, than they would have been uh, without it because the conditions that they attach to them uh, are so uh, destructive to the economy. You can see the biggest loan they ever made uh, in their history was in uh, 2018 to Argentina, $57 billion. And that was a disaster because of the conditions that they attached to it, uh, conditions that shrunk the economy and, uh, and they couldn't get out of it. Uh, they, you know, it was it was a lot like what happened to you know Europe during the Great Recession. They just uh, it was a, a kind of a downward spiral where they cut uh, spending and then the economy shrinks and then they try to cut it even more and they use uh, they you they tighten monetary policy as well raising interest rates and it was it was a total mess. Now it's not always like that, but there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that in the IMF history. And so here you have a mechanism that's totally different. First of all, there are no conditions to attach to these loans, okay? They're not loans, even, actually, in the sense that they're actually not loans. They're, they're given, they're distributed to all countries in the IMF. They don't have to be paid back. Uh, so they don't add to the country's actual debt. And, uh, and they can be done quickly. And again, without these conditions that can be uh, very often harmful. So uh, that's what's so great about them. And that's you know, why we push for this because you look, you, know, you fight for all these other things, like right now, and I can talk about this if you want, you know, we're fighting to try and get the rich countries to distribute, to redistribute the SDRs that they get because they, they, they don't use them. And in fact, they actually technically can't use them uh, under the IMF rules unless they show need. Uh, in practice, you know, it's kind of flexible. I mean, nobody really challenges you if, you if you have need. But nonetheless, you know, the United States can't go in there <laughs> running these 13% of GDP deficits and, and say that we, we have to cash in our SDRs. And they wouldn't want to. It would look disgraceful. And so, uh, so this is something that really works the way this organization really ought to work, you know, actually helping uh, the countries that really need it. And, you know, by the way, that's who goes to the IMF. You know, countries don't go to the IMF very much unless they have to uh, because of the, the, first of all, there's a certain stigma attached to going and getting an IMF loan. It shows that you can't uh, take care of your own economy in a way. Uh, and in fact, you are surrendering the right to take care of your economy because the IMF gives you, uh, basically determines your uh, macroeconomic policy for the duration of the, of the loan, which can go on for years. It comes in tranches and, and so on, and you pay it back over years. So this is a real kind of conversion of the IMF in a sense, uh, not completely, of course, because it still has all this other lending, but it's, 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 it's getting the IMF to do something it hasn't really done. It did have one issuance in, um, one big issuance of SDRs in um, 2009 uh, during the, the world recession then. And that was a big step forward too. Hardly anybody paid that much attention to it. And not many of the SDRs were actually used. Only about 2% were used. And it's not exactly that is used for hard currency, but nonetheless, it helped. It helped a lot. I mean, the countries that use it, it was a lot of money. It was significant, but also it, it gave all these countries, again, reserves that helped uh, stabilize uh, a lot of economies. 
but it wasn't anywhere near this one, of course, it was a lot uh, smaller. And, uh, and again, that was quite a while ago. In fact, you know, we had a, a webinar on this at the IMF, the IMF is having its, its fall meetings right now and the civil society groups are invited uh, to participate. And I did a panel there with uh, Joseph Stiglitz and others. Uh, and um, on this panel, he said that the SDRs should be issued every year. The IMF should make a practice out of that uh, because the world needs, uh, developing countries need this liquidity. Uh, and uh, I think I totally agree with that, of course, and not because he's on our advisory board uh, also, but because uh, he's right about that. Um, and I think that uh, that's another thing that can can move forward. Now, I have to say I'm giving up a kind of an optimistic view here, uh, and I have to, because I've been working on IMF issues for more than 20 years. And uh We've made some, uh, a couple of times we've had victories. And again, it was always when Congress did something, you know? So uh, for example, in the early 2000s, you had this uh, terrible problem that uh, the World Bank, and then again, of course, they act together as a cartel, the IMF, you know, and the World Bank and the International Development, they don't, they don't make loans if the IMF says no, that's been the tradition. It's broken up a little bit as the IMF has lost power in the 21st century, it's lost some of its power to do that. But generally, that's how it was then, and that's how it's generally generally is. They they have even more power over these countries because they uh, you don't do what the IMF says. You don't get a loan from the World Bank either. So the World Bank had this policy, uh, and the international development, and, and sometimes even the private sector. So it's it's quite quite powerful. And here you had in the early 2000s, you had the uh, the World Bank had an actual policy that it was imposing on poor countries that they charge user fees for primary education and primary health care. They had to charge fees. This was a condition of, of lending. And we went to Congress and a lot of people, again, like this kind of a coalition, a lot of people went to Congress and religious groups and said, hey, and you even got, there were even uh, famous uh, you know, actors from Hollywood came and said, hey, look, you know, my kids go to school in the richest school district, one of the richest schools in the country, they don't have to pay fees to go to school, you know, and it became an issue and they, and they reversed it. And uh, so that's another example of how change, I wanna encourage this audience, you can actually make a change like this uh, in this country because it has control over the institutions of global governance. So where did we end up here on these, uh, and that was a digression, but I think it's important to see, you know, that this isn't the first time this happened. And this is part of the resistance we get, by the way. You know, so for example, there's people always that don't like that we're going to Congress because right now, Treasury has the power of God in the world to actually tell a lot of countries what to do. And there's no accountability there, okay? And because Treasury controls, you know, the IMF. and so when Congress gets involved, that's another force. That's another place where a government who's getting, uh, you know, a terrible deal or even worse uh, from the IMF could go to complain if the Congress was more regularly involved in the uh, in, in the process. And you know, it's not real democracy here in the international sense because the other 189 countries still don't have much of a voice. But it's still more accountability than they normally have, okay? So what happened? They passed the 650 uh, and that made a, a big difference. And then the Congress the House came back. And so right now uh, you have, the uh, House has passed uh, legislation once again for the remainder, okay? So we got a quarter of what we were looking for and they want the other uh, 1.5 uh, trillion uh, uh, SDRs which would be uh, about 2.2, I think, uh, 2.1, 2.2 uh, trillion dollars worth of SDR. And there's a bill in the Senate as well uh, for this, and the fight is still on. But uh, I got just another few minutes before the Q&A, right? Is that right? Uh, fair, yeah, okay. So I wanna just say, uh, that, so you can see the other side of this. 
there was a backlash, okay, against the IMF, against the managing director. And so uh, you have uh, a Trump uh, appointee at the World Bank, uh, David Malpass. He's the president of the World Bank. And I have to say, it's unusual to have a president quite like this. He has extreme views on uh, monetary policy. For example, he believes in a gold standard, which is, I don't know any economists actually, I know there's some that exist, but <laughs> I don't know any of them who actually believe in that. Uh, and um, maybe Farad knows <laughs> somebody, I, I don't personally know one. Um, well, actually, I have met one in the last 20 years. He, even worse than that, he's actually on the record uh, saying that uh, when he ran for Senate, uh, you know, he also managed uh, Trump's uh, 2000, and he, 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 met, he was, uh, I, I don't know what he was, a, he was a contributor. Not, no, he was more than a contributor. He, he helped with the Trump uh, 2016 campaign. But he, he's also on the record saying that uh, carbon emissions don't have anything, by humans don't have anything to do with uh, climate. And uh, he said that it's in, and you can see it, Associated Press. Uh, it's in the it's in the news. It hasn't it hasn't taken it back yet. Okay, so this is really unusual to have someone there at the, and the, at the World Bank. So I'll just tell you very briefly what what he did. He uh, he is president of the World Bank, and so he launched an investigation uh, by uh, uh, one of the most expensive law firms in the country uh, of the managing uh, director of the World Bank. And it was supposedly an investigation of this index that the World Bank uh, published, used to publish. Actually, they just cut it out this year. That was another side benefit of the whole investigation. So they got to get rid of this ridiculous indicator that they had called doing business, which was supposed to measure the ease of doing business in various countries. But it came under fire for as long as I can remember. And, and because it's kind of arbitrary. And, uh, and it was you know used to say that um, you know, it was bad to have labor regulations, it was bad to have almost any regulations at all. So they got rid of it this year, right, in, the, in this scandal. So they used the scandal and they created the scandal around the indicator, but they, they pointed the finger at uh, Kristalina Georgieva at the, um, at the IMF because she was, at that time, the chief, uh, uh, she was the, uh, the CEO uh, of the World Bank. And so they blamed her, uh, they, they accused her of something, and this law firm, which was unlike the other panels that actually looked at this indicator because it was kind of you know shaky, uh, it didn't have any experts on it. It was just a law firm doing an investigation and targeting her and not telling her. They actually lied and told her that she was uh, not a subject of the investigation. So they went after her. And if you followed the news in the last month or so, you can see that they almost got rid of her. Uh, but they didn't because uh, people pushed back. And, um, and, and, and in fact, the European countries, and this is a historic change, by the way. This is well, another reason I'm mentioning this, because this is about the IMF and what they can do and what they don't do. And, and the uh, Europeans actually stood up to the IMF, uh, to the Treasury Department, at the IMF, because they almost always go with them, you know, uh, they vote with them as a block. I mean, they don't even vote actually, because they reach agreement, because there's 60% of the votes is just the high income countries, so they don't have to vote. Once they get agreement, uh, it's over. And so they didn't agree, and they didn't get rid of her. And uh, that's a historic uh, change as well. So uh, that's, I think, probably enough. I'll, I'll end there, but if you, you know, for anybody who wants to talk to Senator Inhofe, uh, I think you should try and do it. He has talked to people and he does seem to agree with us because he has a particular interest he, that he, uh, he, he, he does care uh, about Africa. Thank you, Mark. Uh, a fascinating uh, story going on with IMF. We have a few questions that I'll take the, the privilege myself first. And I'm, I'm curious about the changes you mentioned at the IMF. As you explained, um, IMF doesn't have a very good track record in the Global South. Um, and there have been many speculations and talks about whether IMF has changed after the 2008 
crisis or after the European sovereign debt crisis. But then the austerity measures in Greece uh, show that IMF is the same old same. Um, so do you see any structural change regarding like what is triggering this push for SDRs to be distributed to the South or developing countries? And is this a systemic structural change or what other um, currents are pushing it in this direction? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it's a complex reality and I don't want to oversimplify. And, you know, if you go, for instance, to the web, I think we've posted them all. You know, I have a whole set of videos where I debate economists all the way up the ladder at the uh, IMF over their policies in uh, during the, the during the uh, world recession and uh, after it, and especially in Europe. And you can see from uh, a number of those debates, they stopped doing them <laughs> after a while. You can see that the economists agree with me on 80 to 90% of what I was saying. They, they could all, uh, a lot of them could see that it was wrong, especially in Europe. And, you know, that's part of the, I, you know, I mean, I, I think it's part of the colonialism of the institution that they can see it more and more easily in the rich countries than they can in the in the developing uh, countries. Uh, but also, you have a big split between and and and, and IMF economists have said this actually uh, between the research department of the IMF and some of the other decision makers. Uh, so you know, if the research economists uh, research department was running the IMF, I think you'd see uh, significantly different policies. You have seen some changes. Uh, you know, you know. again, it's complicated because I, I can't claim, I'm not inside there. I can't claim to know like who's deciding uh, a lot of these things. Again, when you talk to the economists, they say, yeah, you know, this is, this is a mistake, this is wrong. But, uh, and then it still, it still happens. And because, you know, economists, you know, there's all these jokes about how economists don't agree. And, you, you know, if you, what is the famous one? If you put them all together around the world, they couldn't reach a conclusion. Uh, and, but it's not really true. You know, there's a good part of standard macroeconomics that's just arithmetic and accounting. <laughs> and the economists tend to agree on it. And so uh, it takes a, a little bit of acrobatics sometimes to justify uh, some of these uh, policies and their economists won't, won't go along with it, even if they're uh, conservative uh, or, you know, respect other goals that the IMF and the U.S. government might have. And uh, so, but in any case, I think if you, um, if you look at the change, here's one big change that happened, uh, let's see, 2018 or 19, I have a bad memory for the exact dates, you know, but the, I have to look at it, but it was just in the last couple of years, it was the, the Argentine government had to restructure its debt because it, uh, because the economy, you know, the, basically the, the IMF loan with their conditions, it financed a whole, a whole lot of capital flight and their, their debt to GDP ratio increased by 29 percentage points in a year. Uh, you know, they couldn't pay and they had to restructure. And so for the, this is another unprecedented thing. Uh, and maybe the IMF could give you another example, but I can't. They actually took the Argentine government's side with the big creditors, uh, you know, against the big creditors, I should say. So the big banks and the big international finance, the big uh, uh, financial institutions the, the, the fund took the government side and said, this debt is not sustainable and they're not going to be able to pay it and you're going to have to take a haircut. And, uh, and so uh, that, uh, I think, helped the Argentine government uh, at least partly get out from under some of this. But then they've all, they still got the big IMF debt to pay, pay off. Now, again, the SDRs did help. They got $4 billion that they immediately... Uh, used uh, to pay off uh, IMF debt, and uh, because you, SDRs can be used for that, I didn't mention that actually. That's an important point too. They can be used directly to uh, pay off any interest or principal payments uh, to uh, the IMF, and so that's a, a change. And oh yeah, can I say one thing? I just forgot to to mention for explanation that when they issue the SDRs. They issue them in proportion 
to the country's quota at the IMF. So the rich countries get 60% of the SDR. Now that might seem you know, like a waste, but it doesn't turn out to be a waste because they just don't use them. It's just an accounting entry. I say that it's important because the people who are against the SDRs, they try and say that now you're giving all the money to the, it's not money, right? It's just, you know, they don't convert it to hard currency, so it doesn't matter. That's the main argument that the other side actually use, uses and it still uses, you know, against the SDR. But that's important to realize that that doesn't matter. The easiest way to get money to developing countries that really need it is through this mechanism. And the other stuff just sits there on the books, except for the fact that it can now be uh, used to, uh, you know, they can recycle their SDRs uh, to the developing countries. And then again, there's a, a push for that. But of course, the IMF and uh, Treasury are pushing it forward to go through the IMF, you know, to go through another one of the funds lending facilities. Okay, sorry, I just had to say that because it was part of the story that I left. No, no, that's excellent. Actually, that's one of the questions that came from the floor about this SDR redistribution. As you mentioned, um, is it going to be based on the quotas, which they normally, that's how they do. So like 17% would go to the US and then- No, no, absolutely not. The whole purpose of the redistribution is to give the uh, SDRs to, to developing countries or loan them. That's the problem, you see. I mean, if, if it goes through the, uh, the, uh, the PRGT, the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, which is the main uh, or, or one of the uh, lending facilities for low-income countries, then it's going to be loans and it's going to be loans that have to pay back, most likely. Uh, and it's going to be, uh, have conditions attached. There's talk about creating another trust to do them. I mean, and then there, France even said, the government of France even said that they wanted to take some of theirs and, and distribute themselves, which is that that's a that would be another historic change because they they wouldn't be uh, under the command of the U.S. Treasury Department if they if they did that. So I, I'm for that. Um, and then also. They want to be able to loan to middle income countries. So there's a lot of issues with the recycling, the redistribution that I didn't have time to go into. I think it's it could be a net positive thing if it doesn't all, uh, it, it will be a net positive thing. I think it will be net positive. But the question is how net positive it's gonna be depends on whether, uh, how much of this ends up as loans that are add to, uh, to the debt of countries who already have unsustainable debt. Uh, Oh, and and uh, how much of it uh, has actual conditions attached to it, the way IMF lending usually does. Thank you. Another question is about the politics side of this. Uh, one of our listeners said, um, I'm reading, can you talk a little about pressure being applied to Republicans around Imhoff uh, to make sure he has support if he agrees to insert something into the NDAA again? So what is the background regarding, like, what is the cause of the opposition also and what kind of pressures are being applied? What is the main reason for opposing? Oh, that's another interesting question, actually, because, you know, it's one of these questions where, uh, you know, it's not that easy to, to say. I mean, I, I gave you like the main reason that Mnuchin argued that, uh, you know, against the SDRs, he said, oh, well, you know, about 60% going to rich countries, which turns out to be a meaningless thing. So that was what they used. That was the only one that he really used publicly in the press. And then some Republicans, after about a year, almost, I think it was, started to come up with this argument, we don't want these because they're going to go to China. You know, China gets a chunk. They have 6% of the reserves. Uh, they have 6% quota at the IMF, which is, you know, about a third of the U.S., even though their economy is bigger than ours. Um, and so they still would get a chunk. But, you know, they, they, they can't use them. Uh, first of all, they don't have need of $3 trillion in reserves. And second of all, yeah, like now that's, that's it there. And, and, then they, so, and then they point to the countries they don't like, you know, like Iran or, um, you know, Belarus, whoever they hate at the moment. Uh, they don't want them uh, getting them. Uh, and th those are the main things. But if you look at it closely, like you look at the fights 
and what people have said, what these, uh, you know, like Republican leadership uh, in the, you know, Senator Risch, uh, for example, uh, uh, ranking member of the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, they tend to, they tend to, you know, frame it in terms of countries we don't like mostly, but also uh, they're trying to use it as a partisan issue against the Democrats, you know, and uh, I think that that's, that really can't, they can't really get very far with it. And they haven't gotten very far because first of all, nobody, hardly anyone knows about it. <laughs> and, and, and probably even fewer people care. It doesn't cost the US government anything. And by the way, I didn't even mention that the US lost over 2 million jobs as a result of exports uh, you know, that we lose because the rest of the world economy is shrinking. And we would get some of those back, uh, uh, you know, uh, or we will get some of those back because of the stabilization effect of the SDRs in, in, in other countries and developing countries. And so anyway, they don't really have much of a case and they're not, I don't think anybody's going to get a campaign commercial against them in an election that says, you know, he voted for SDRs, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't think they're going to be able to pull that off, but that's, that's what they're, that's what they're doing. And, and can we talk about also the size of the, the SDRs uh, in terms of how they came up with that number? I, if you look at the contraction in world economy, especially in the global South, plus the inequity of the distribution of the vaccines where, you know, or 90% went to the developed countries, uh, large parts of Sub-Saharan Africa has hardly any vaccines in most countries. Um, so is the amount that they agreed to three trillion plus dollars roughly the size of the contraction in those economies or how did they come up with that number? First of all, the vaccines, I mean, I don't even have the estimate in my mind right now of how much it would cost, but it's pretty small. You know, even at the patent protected prices, it's not a lot of money. It's nowhere near, uh, I mean, it's nowhere near a sizable fraction of this money even that was allocated, you know. Uh, that's, uh, that's to me just outrageous that they don't just take care of that immediately, you know. What was the other uh, part of it? The um, so the the size of the, the SDR. How did they? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Where did it come from? Yeah, I think it came from uh, Georgieva's speech. That was an IMF estimate. She said that was the financing need. So that's kind of a. And she said, by the way, and it was probably higher than that when she said it in that speech on March twenty sixth or twenty seventh in twenty twenty. I remember it because it was really something, you know, for her to say that. And suggest that that should be what they do. So that was that was kind of a bare minimum. That was saying, you know, these are the financing mean, needs of developing countries. That's where the 2.8 trillion came. That the groups uh, went to Congress and uh, and Congress uh, and the House proposed. Okay. Um, and another question is in terms of again related to the IMF changes in the IMF and also global competition. I mean, China and others established the, the South Bank, which became a rival to World Bank, and China is now the largest lender of Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. According to one estimate, the total lending from China to Latin America is more than US, EU, World Bank, and IMF combined. How do you put this in that context regarding IMF SDR debates, uh, changing the track, perhaps being more growth or uh, development friendly, rather than just austerity-based measures? Um, does China have a role to play here in terms of pushing IMF in that direction, especially given the debates over the quota allocation of the fund, which, as you mentioned, was decided after the Second World War, reflecting the economic sizes of countries in 1945, not 2021? Yes, well, I think that's a big uh, you know, question going forward, too. I mean, China is the largest economy, uh, as you know, uh, in, in the world by a uh, purchasing power parity uh, measure, which is what economists generally use for international comparisons, because it adjusts for prices, you know, and it's the relevant one for China. It doesn't cost even for military uh, comparison, you know, it doesn't cost the same amount of money to produce a fighter jet in China that it does in the United States. And so uh, whatever, however you want to look at it, it's a bigger economy than the U.S. And if you just uh, extend out current uh, growth rates, Within nine years, 
uh, China is going to be, uh, Chinese economy is going to be twice the size of the United States. It's going to be a very different world. And uh, so I think what you're looking at right now is it just, it's, it's an inevitable uh, thing when the economy, you, know, you have another economy that's big, that's that big. And you have the United States, especially in Latin America, which the United States government has, you know, since the Monroe Doctrine considered to be its territory. Uh, and imposes conditions and even overthrows governments. Uh, you know, China, whatever you want to say about their lending there and, you know, and what they bargain for and, and so on, they don't do, they don't impose those kind of conditions. They don't get involved in the internal uh, politics. So it's, it's perfectly understandable, especially in the 21st century when you uh, had this unprecedented second independence of, of, of Latin America, uh, you know, where the uh, majority of people in the region had, uh, for the first time, uh, lived under left of center governments. It wasn't possible before because the United States didn't allow it. And, and then, of course, the, you know, our government pushed back and got rid of some of them. And uh, I'm still doing that. You know, this is... Uh, you know, in this kind of a situation, you can see why governments, and not just left-wing governments, just any government that wants to have a, a certain set of economic policy. I mean, imagine, for instance, if Argentina could, well, that was a right-wing government, okay, so that was different. <laughs> but if, well, you actually did see this, actually, in the, in the I was just going to say, you know, they would get money, everybody would get money from China instead of the IMF if they could, because you don't, have these con these conditions, and you did see that in the you know in the in the first decade of the 21st century, uh, both Argentina and uh, Brazil paid off the IMF. It was large amounts of money. Brazil was over 15 billion dollars just to get rid of the IMF because the IMF sat down with Lula and his opponent in the 2002 election when it was still going on and said, look. These are the here's a thirty billion dollar loan, and this is what you're going to do for the next four years. You're going to run primary budget surpluses of three point seven five percent, and they couldn't really do their program for their first term. Okay, and of course Argentina is much worse. You know what the the IMF did there uh, in the in that time period, and so they paid them off as soon as they could too. I think it was uh, two thousand six. You know because the fund was involved in in, in the restructuring, and not only the economic policies that they had to implement during their recession, their, their, which was like, a, I mean, their depression. And so again, this is something that is going to uh, continue as long as China exists and as long as the United States is part of a group that imposes uh, conditions and in Latin America does worse things than that, um, you know, that come with their money. Thank you. And you briefly mentioned the World Bank and our topics on the IMF, but I, these are the twin institutions. Is there much coordination of um, the COVID response or the head of the World Bank? And um, as you know, that they usually get the World Bank gets American president and IMF gets a European president uh, since 1945. So is there an obstacle coming from the World Bank to the IMF efforts or they are trying to coordinate this effort? Well, uh, just for you know, the sake of uh, explanation, you know, the IMF, uh, the head of the IMF is a European, and the uh, American heads the World Bank, and that's the gentleman's agreement that was made. It's not in the charter; <laughs> it's just an agreement that's been carried out for more than seventy years. But I have to say, it's a little misleading in in the sense that because most people don't understand it, that doesn't mean the Europeans run the IMF. <laughs> They get to have a European as the managing director. But as you can just see, as uh, Georgieva was almost removed uh, by the United States, um, uh, that they don't have the full uh, authority of that. But in terms of coordination, well, I don't know, you know what's going on on the ground you know, in terms of COVID response from the World Bank because they have actual you know, projects and things. But I have to say, uh, this attempt by the president of the World Bank, because he paid for and launched that investigation against the managing director of the, of the IMF, uh, 
it just shows that there's something a lot worse than coordination going on. And, and, and of course, uh, Georgieva did intend for the SDRs to be part of the IMF, a big part of the IMF's uh, response uh, to COVID. In terms of coordination, this is quite the opposite of coordination. The World Bank head president tries to get rid of the managing director and in and, and the SDRs, which were part of the, which I think were part of the motivation and most people do, you know, that's a major part of the IMF's response uh, to COVID to get these countries money. Thank you. I think we are also up the time. Uh, thank you for a great conversation. Um, I hope our listeners um, learned a lot as much as I did, uh, especially with the internal infighting and going on with the SDRs. I think most of us miss that in the broader scheme of the things regarding look, looking from outside, how the policy making uh, is made uh, or how the food is cooked in the kitchen part or sausage is made, as they say. So thank you. Um, our webinar is over for today. Uh, thank you everyone for participating and for your questions.